Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about the artistic and spiritual side of Jomon culture, which includes ceramics, statues, rituals, funerals, rites of passage, and more. For those of you who might be new to the channel, this video is part of a series on Japanese history and mythology. We have already discussed the Paleolithic era, or Stone Age, in great detail, and we are now exploring the subsequent era, Jomon. There's some debate as to whether the Jomon era corresponds to the Japanese Metolithic or Neolithic, so we call it the Ceramic Age instead, since it's mainly the use of ceramics that distinguishes it from the previous period. In the first video, I talk about the era in general terms, and in the second, I cover the topics of housing and food. And since today we are going to talk about art, I thought uh, I would make a slightly different video. I've got some clay here, and I'm going to try to use it to create a vessel with influences from Jomon culture, taking into account everything I've studied to make this video. Now, I have no idea how this will turn out, because I'm not an expert on the subject, I do not know how to sculpt. This isn't a tutorial, okay? But I will try to create a small vase, and instead of seeing my face as usual, you will see me building it and it will serve as a sort of background while I talk about today's topic. As already mentioned, the Jomon period is international and globally recognized for the ceramic legacies it left to be discovered today. Some of the vases created at the time are even extremely elaborate and indicative of a complex society. One of the techniques ancient people used to decorate these vases was to apply rope to the wet surface of the clay. As many of the pots were marked with rope, the period became known by the name Jomon, which means precisely cord market. The types of art dating back to the Jomon era have also been found, as we will see, but let's first talk about what hasn't been found. The Paleolithic era in many parts of the world is characterized by prehistoric art, cave paintings, as in southwest France, or stonework, as in Australia. The Japanese Paleolithic is characterized by neither one type of art nor the other. Although more than 5,000 Paleolithic archaeological sites have been discovered to date, they contain no traces of widespread art practice. Jomon art thus appears to be the primordial one. Materials such as stone, including precious stone, bone and wood were used, but ceramics predominated. Cave paintings were not part of the Jomon's artistic universe. Archaeologists have divided and classified Jomon pottery into 70 types, but this is without counting regional varieties. I'm not going to talk about all 70 types, and even if I wanted to, I wouldn't be able to, because it's not possible to find information that specific, perhaps only in Japanese. However, even if I had access to it, I would probably leave you a link in the description, because it would be too boring to be talking about it here. The first pots were small, 10 to 50 cm height, and had round bottoms, which would not allow them to be placed on flat surfaces. It is thought that these pots were used to prepare food and transport it, and that their small size allowed the Jomon to move them from one camp to another. With the development of a sedentary lifestyle, the pots began to increase in size and feature increasingly elaborate decorations. The bottoms went from round to flat. The construction of ceramic containers is not characteristic of intergatorial communities, which are almost always nomadic, since places made from this material are heavy, fragile, bulky and difficult to transport, but the Jomon have acquired a level of sedentariness that is unusual for people living off nature, one thing promoted the development of the other and vice versa. The Jomon community also had an advantage over most other intergatorial communities, which was the abundance of natural resources. With the end of the Ice Age and the subsequent warming, the archipelago was particularly prosperous, and food sources could sustain large communities. In fact, the very invention of ceramics allowed the Jomon to cook ingredients in ways they couldn't before, and to eat foods that were previously either too hard to heat, too bitter, or even harmful, which further broadened the spectrum of resources that could be used. All Jomon pots were made by hand, as the potter's wheel had not yet been invented. One of the most commonly used techniques was the coiling method, 
a process in which the pot is built from the base and spirals of steel soft clay are deposited on top of each other. The first step in this process consists of creating a base, which defines how wide and how thick the pot will be. Ten pieces of clay are shaped into a long, cylindrical form and placed on top of each other. After each spiral has been placed, it must be connected to the element immediately above and below, so that it doesn't get attached at a later stage. This smoothing can be done by hand or with tools. It is important to smooth the inside of the pot as well as the outside, although the spiral shape can remain slightly noticeable on the outside for aesthetic reasons if that is desired. It is at this point, while the clay is still soft and malleable, that the decorations are made. Jamon pottery was decorated in many ways. People created patterns using their fingernails, digits, cells, sticks, spatulas made from bamboo and other woods, and of course rope. Excess clay was used to create 3D ornaments. Sometimes the pots were lacquered, which resulted in a bright red or a super black or a mixture of the two colors. The Jomon were one of the first civilizations to mark their pots with ropes. This practice was also common in cultures in Northern Europe and Western Russia, but these cultures emerged later, 3000 to 2200 years ago. This is therefore how the Jomon created many of their pots. The pots were then set out to dry and later baked over an outdoor fire, never at temperatures higher than 900 degrees. The Jomon mixed various materials with the clay to make it more resistant or increase its adhesiveness. Examples include lead, fibers, crushed cells and mica or fool's gold, which could be collected from the mountains north of Tokyo and in streams in the Kanto region. Fool's gold, when mixed with clay, was able to make it more resistant to heat, making the baking process easier and reducing the shrinkage of the material when drying. As with Neolithic cultures, it is thought that the Jomon women were the ones who were primarily responsible for producing the pots. Let's now take a closer look at how the shapes and appearance of the pots differ throughout the era, and also what the Jomon used the pots for. Spoiler, the pots weren't just for cooking and storing food. During the incipient and initial phases of the Jomon period, pots were used for cooking outdoors, as their bottoms were round or oval, often thinner than the openings, this is bullet shaped, the pots could not stand on their own and had to be placed in sand, soft soil, in the ashes in the center of a fire, or stabilized with stones. The first pieces of pottery were found at the Oda Yamamoto 1 archaeological site in 1998 and later also at Kami Kuroye and Fuku Cave. All of them were estimated to have been created around 40,500 BC. The very thin walls of the pots soon began to be decorated, around 10,000 years ago, with patterns made using bamboo sticks, nails and ropes, as well as impressions of other objects, shells for example. It is believed that before creating ceramic pots, the Jomon may have built containers from other materials, such as leather, bark or woven reeds. Regional differences became apparent from the early Jomon period onwards, and it was also during this phase that flat-bottomed pots appeared, albeit sporadically. The vases characteristic of the early Jomon remained conical in shape, with wide openings and slender bottoms, but the flat bottom, as opposed to round and oval, gained popularity, which indicates that the use of ceramics also began to take place inside houses. Sculpted rims and imprints became more elaborate, and lacquer was used for the first time. There was also the introduction of other forms. In addition to wide-mounted vases, there were also vases with narrow necks and shallow balls. It is believed that the latter were used during ceremonies and or as funerary goods. It was during the Middle Jomon that ceramics reached its peak of complexity, with the most impressive pieces being legacies of that period. And by most impressive, I mean the largest and most flamboyantly decorated. To support the lavish decorations, the walls of the vases became thicker. Three distinct types of vase were produced during the Middle Jomon, the Katsuzaka, the Tamadai and the Kazoi He. The Katsuzaka were produced by mountain dwellers, had a reddish color and were grandly decorated. The figure of the snake was common, so it is possible that this animal was venerated. Otamadai were produced by the inhabitants of the lowlands, had a brownish color and had mica in their composition. 
Her designs were much simpler than those of the Kazuzaka. Finally, the Kazori E were characterized by being salmon colored. Middle Jomon vases can also be named according to the decoration associated with them. The edges of the Kayangata vases are carved in the shape of what are thought to be flames, while the edges of Okkangata vases resemble crowns. These vases are also decorated with spirals, which some suggest imitate waves of a river, protuberances, inverted S's, figures that resemble an eight, called dragon eyes, animals, such as the aforementioned snake, human faces, among others. Just by looking at some of these vases, you can tell that they are not practical, so they might have been used for decoration. One type of vase in particular, shaped like a lamp, appear at this stage. It is possible that they were used in rituals. Another special type of vase was made to be buried along babies who died shortly after giving birth. These vases illustrated the moment of birth, with the mother's face carved close to the mouth and the baby's lower down, as if it were coming out of its mother's belly. Jars and zugs are evidence that by this time the Jomon people already knew how to ferment fruit and make wine from it, as we also saw in the previous video. Bowls were used for serving, food and drink, pots with narrow necks for steaming, and there were even large pots that were used to evaporate sea water and obtain salt from it. Sometimes very deep pots were used for burying babies and children. During this period, the technique of burnishing was used on some surfaces, perhaps as an attempt to reduce the porosity of the vessels. It is interesting to note that the quality of the ceramics did not evolve along with the ornamentation. As we entered the late phase of the Jowan period, the walls of the vases became thinner again and the decoration simpler. The pottery on the other end was of higher quality, and the shapes and forms became even more diverse. The surfaces took on less flashy colors and were more polished. Rope impressions came back into fashion, as did curvilinear patterns, with the difference that these rope marks were now softened, partially erased, the technique is known as erased cord marking. Black lacquer began to be widely used and gave rise to a type of vase in central Kyushu, the Goryu, into Oku, a delicate and sophisticated style called Kamega Oka developed. The distinction between simple vessels for cooking and storage and refined vessels to be used in rituals became more evident. In the final phase of the Jomon era, ceramics became even simpler in terms of design, Lines with a vague S shape became more common. In terms of the shapes and types of vases and their respective uses, diversity remained unchanged. Vases of all shapes continued to be produced. The Kamegawaka style continued to be used in northern Tuoku and also spread to southern Hokkaido. It's interesting to note how the sophisticated northern style contrasted with the more austere style that came to, do to dominate the other regions. As you can see, Jomon vases come in many shapes and forms, but in general they can be classified into six groups. Fukabashi, which are the most common, Azabashi, which are shallow, Ashi, which have a moderate depth, Sara, which are, which are very shallow, almost like plates, Tsubo, which have narrow mouths and wide necks, and Shuko, which have spouts. Ceramics is not the only art form that characterizes the Jomon culture. Dogu are also very famous. These terracotta statues come in a huge variety of shapes. One has a felon face and no legs, another is wearing a heart-shaped face, another is wearing a mask, some are faceless, there are those carrying pots and those sitting, you can see horns on one, some have flattened heads or bowed legs, one is dressed in a kind of bodice, and there are many more. Around 20,000 dogu have been found, taken from archaeological sites from southern Hokkaido to the Osaka region. The most famous dogu comes from Kamega Oka and has abnormally round eyes with horizontal lines in the center. Google eyes is a term in that many texts used to refer to them. The body is full of marks made by ropes. This dogu's appearance led to theories that the Jomon worshipped aliens from outer space. Personally, this dogu's eyes remind me of the closed eyes of lizards, and I'm surprised I haven't come across anyone making this comparison. Maybe they are not that similar and it's just in my head? 
I don't know. But it looks like that to me. As well as coming in many shapes, Dogu also come in all sizes. Some are teeny and fit in the palm of your hand, about 3 cm, and others are quite large, over 30 cm. Despite the variety found, there is a tendency for them to have large heads, robust bodies, and scrivelled arms and hands. Ceramic figures already existed in the incipient phase of the Jomon period. At the Aidani Kumahara archaeological site in Igashiyomi, Shiga prefecture, a small statue was found that has been dated to be 13 years old. It is thought to be one of the oldest found in Japan. It is believed that the figure, with a height of 3.1 cm and a height of 14.6 grams, was sculpted in the image of a female torso. In Matsu Zaka, Mie prefecture, another female figure was found which is thought to, to date from the same period. The figures dating back to before the middle Jomon have curved clear lines and are somewhat abstract with no faces and sometimes not even heads. The female figures show no obvious signs of pregnancy. Dr. Kobayashi, professor of archaeology at Kogugakui University, Tokyo, is of the opinion that this ancient dogu represents sacred spirits, which could not be seen, which explains why people avoided detailing the faces. With the arrival of the Middle Jomon phase, the number of statues increased exponentially. Faces took on different expressions, three-dimensionality emerged, and female figures were sculpted in such a way as to clearly express pregnancy, with large breasts and swollen abdomens. This radical change in the dogu's appearance might indicate that they began to play a different role in people's lives. Some of the figures found have holes in the neck area, and it is presumed that these holes serve the purpose of allowing them to be hung somewhere inside or outside the dwellings, in order to fulfill some spiritual role. Another curious fact is that most of the small dogu were found broken. While it might have been thought that this was the result of the passage of time, Further analysis revealed that the dogu were actually broken on purpose. There are a few theories about the reason behind this practice. Some think that the dogu were representative of divine spirits, and that breaking them would conclude some kind of ceremony or ritual. Others think that the dogu were supposed to represent specific people, and that breaking them would protect those people from illness and disaster, or alternatively, that it would purify them. So, for example, if someone had a leg injury, the leg of the Dogu statue associated with it would be broken, so that that of the real person would eat more quickly and effectively, or this would be done preventively, so that the injury didn't occur at all. In some rural areas of present-day Japan, figures are built to protect people from disasters and epidemics. This might be related. And yet, it is impossible to say for sure why people broke the Dogu or what the purpose of the dogu was in the first place, since there are no written records to explain it. Scholars firmly believe that they add spiritual and cultural importance, but the details are unclear. Were they part of fertility rituals, given the abundance of representations of female figures? Were they related to the veneration of ancestors, or deities and spirits present in nature? Were they amulets that the Jomon used to ask for divine favors? Perhaps different types of dogu fulfill different roles. Some archaeologists believe that the pregnant figures were created in the image of a goddess related to nature and or fertility, such as the Earth Mother, the Great Mother or the Great Goddess. Genetic studies showing that the Jomons were Y-chromosome carriers of haplogroups D and C support these theories, as these haplogroups are related to the Tibeto Bruma and Buryat Siberian populations, and both populations practice this type of cult. Others believe that the figures were created by women not in reverence for a deity, but as a symbol of self protection and good luck. They could have been used in fertility rituals to increase the chance of having babies and them being born guilty or in protection rituals, so that the status quo would protect them from the risks of childbirth. One of the most striking Dogu statues is known as Jomon of Venus, the Venus of the Jomon. It's one of the figures we have been just been talking about. 
This statue is one of the largest, measuring 27 centimeters in height, weighing 2.14 kilograms, and was unearthed from the Tanaba Take archaeological site in the Yonezawa district. It is estimated to have been created around 1000 BC and is considered a national treasure. The heads of some dogu are crowned with a coiled snake, which might indicate that the snake was a sacred animal. The snakes that were immortalized in ceramics by the Jomon are most likely Mamushi, a species that can be found in the high, cold mountains and in the lake Suwa region. The bite of this reptile affects the nervous system and is fatal, an ability that causes fear and respect. Dogu continued to be built in abundance during the phases following the Middle Jomon and even during the Yayoi period but then disappeared to make way for another type of sculpture, the Aniwa, in the Kofun period. Kami no Megami, masked goddess, another dogu which is also a national treasure, dates back to around 2000 BC, deceased to the late Jomon. It is 34 cm tall and weighs 2.7 kg, and was found at the Nakapara archaeological site in the Koigashi district. The most striking feature of this dogu is its face, uh, which is shaped like an inverted triangle. At the back of the head is a line, which might represent a rope. Therefore, the figure might well be wearing a mask, with the corresponding rope that would allow it to adjust it. This dogu was found in a burial pit and had a broken right leg. The pieces of the leg were found inside the statue's body. This was done intentionally. One last dogu feature that is important to note is that the faces of many of them appear to be tattooed. The first figure with tattoos, which they call Kasaka, was discovered at the archaeological site of Kasaka in the town of Sagamihara, Kanagawa Prefecture. It is dated to 5000 BC. Some of the tattoos seem to be repeated on several of the figures, notably double lines that cross the cheeks from the eyes. Of these types of tattoos on the status might represent real tattoos that the Jomon, that the Jomon wore. Further evidence can be found in a Chinese record called Gishi Wa Jin Den, which states that the people of Wa, which is how the Chinese referred to the Japanese at the time, tattooed their face and painted them with pink and scarlet ink. The exact words are as follows. One men tattoo their faces and paint their bodies with designs. They are fond of diving in search of fish and shells. Long ago, they decorated their bodies to protect themselves from big fish. Later, the designs became ornamental. The body paintings differ between the various tribes. The position and size of the designs vary according to the rank of the individuals. They rub their bodies with pink and scarlet, just as we Chinese who spounder. Tattooed dogu became common in the Kanto region around 3300 BC and lasted until the late Jomon period. The reason why this is so interesting is because tattoos are frowned upon in Japan today, although this is also changing little by little. There are several reasons behind this and one day we will discuss those reasons, but not today. When people within Japan we, who have a history with tattoos are the Hainu. It is known that Ainu women, until very recently, tattooed their lips. According to the tradition, these tattoos were a gift from the ancestral mother of Okikurumi, Turesh Mashi, the younger sister of the creator god Okikurumi. Lip tattoos indicated that the Ainu woman was of marriageable age. For some Ainu, tattoos also had a protective and healing function and were able to repel evil spirits. In the previous video I mentioned the Ainu and in this one I've mentioned them again. So let me just talk a, a little about these people, given their strong relationship with the Jomon. Don't worry, I will be brief, not least because I intend to dedicate several videos to the Ainu in the future. I don't know if I have already mentioned this, but my favorite manga and anime is Golden Kamui, so you know, I'm guaranteed to talk about the Ainu in great detail. The Hainu are an indigenous ethnic group living in Hokkaido, the Kuril Islands and Sakhalin. In the 19th century, the Japanese called Hokkaido Ezoshi, meaning land of the Hainu. 
During the 15th century, the Aino also lived on Onshu, but waves of newcomers pushed the communities even further north, as well as bringing infectious diseases that caused the death of many of them. The land that had previously belonged to the Hainu was distributed to Japanese farmers. In 1899, the Japanese government declared the Hainu to be former aborigines and decreed that they had to be integrated into the Japanese population. The assimilation policies had a drastic effect on the Hainu communities and almost erased their traditions. The Hainu language was banned and Hainu children were forced to attend schools and were given new Japanese names, which they had to use instead of the original Ainu ones. As a result, many Hainu suffered discrimination and their ancestry became a source of shame. The Hak remained in force for just over a hundred years, until it was repealed in June 2008. Not only that, but the Ainu were officially recognized as an indigenous people with their own language, religion and culture. Nowadays, there is a desire to preserve this culture, which almost died out. It is quite clear that there is a, re a relationship between the Jomon and the Ainu, as indicated by genetic markers D and D2. Although this relationship is not direct. For example, the Ainu also carried the Y chromosome of haplogroup C3, which shows a paternal lineage from North Asia. Non-metric cranial studies also indicate that the Ainu occupy an intermediate place between the Jomon and the Okhotsk a people from Northern Asia. So, although the Ainu have more Jomon DNA than any other people, they are not direct descendants of the Jomon, nor of the Emichi Satsumo. In the Yukar Oupopu, Legends of the Ainu, it is said that the Ainu lived in this place a hundred thousand years before the arrival of the Children of the Sun. Another art form that comes from the Jomon are the Magatame beads. It is known that they were initially used as ornaments and later became ceremonial objects. But the reasons behind their shape are shrouded in mystery. Some say they represent the fangs of beasts, such as wolves or bears. Some say their shape is reminiscent of fish hooks. Others suggest that they pay homage to the crescent moon and the celestial world in general. Or even that they represent a soul or spirit. Some even made a connection between the shape of the magatama and livers or fetuses. Scholars who ignore the shape of the magatama and focus instead on their function suggest that they were used to contact the gods or the dead, to exercise evil spirits, restore youth, ask for a blissful journey or a bountiful harvest, after agriculture was introduced of course, or as a way of binding someone's soul to their body. Magatama were used from the Jomon period, having been introduced around 1000 BC to the Kofun period. In the Jomon period, they were made from all kinds of natural materials – clay, talc, slate, quartz, gneiss, jadeite, nephrit, and serpentinite – but later they were, built, they were built almost exclusively from jade. The Stone Age Magatama, this is those built during the Jomon period, were irregular and lacked continuity of form. It is possible that they were not used for ceremonial purposes yet. A large number of magatama were found at the Kamegawaka archaeological site in Sugaru, more than at any other site. The largest magatama were also found here, and both are evidence of the ice status that Kamegawaka possessed. The Jomon people held festivals during which shamanic rituals and music and dance took place. Percussion instruments such as ceramic drums dominated the music of the period. In addition to drums, the Jomon also built whistles made from deer bone, stone and pottery, as well as primitive koto that could be strummed. This image shows a replica of a ceramic whistle from the Jomon period. The original was found in the Satohama shell mound in Miyagi prefecture. The whistle can produce different sounds depending on the holes that are plugged with the fingers all of which are similar to birds chirping. It is believed that the whistle was used to attract these birds, as an aid in the hunting process. We have already seen that over the centuries, Jomon burial rituals became more and more elaborate, with the creation of ceremonial areas, cemeteries and the increase and diversification of the goods that were buried with the dead. 
The most common Jomon method of dealing with the bodies of the dead was to bury them in pits, without cremation. Cremation occurred only in rare cases, and mass cremations were even rarer. The bodies were placed in the pits with their knees bent. The burial pits were round, oval or oblong. Bottle-shaped pits were first used for storage, but later they also began to be used as burial pits. The pits were marked with stone circles called Kanjo Aizeki Bo. In Western Japan, collective secondary burials were sometimes practiced. The skeletons were removed from the place where the bodies had first been buried and buried en masse in a larger pit. This larger pit was not closed until much later, and in the meantime, new bodies were added. When the pit was finally sealed, a structure was built to cover it. There were also occasions when the dead were buried in jars. In 80% of the cases, the deceased contained in, the, in these funeral jars were babies or stillborn children, who were buried with the placenta. But children were also often buried in this way. The practice was common in both Eastern and Western Japan. At the Sanai Maruyama archaeological site alone, 1800 burial jars containing infants and children have been found. The jars were arranged vertically, and those placed in them were positioned so that they were curled up on themselves in an, anato in an anatomically natural position. Many of the jars were bottomless, or had a perforated bottom. In the final phase of the Jomon period, red jars lacquered with iron oxide were found containing precious ornaments, which might indicate that the babies and children buried in them came from important families. Some adults were also buried in this way during this period. An extraordinary type of secondary burial consisted of removing the bones from the original burial site and placing them in a jar, after the decomposition process had already eroded the soft tissues. Sometimes the bones were arranged in a rectangular shape, it is not known why. Dogs were also buried, which indicates that they were important animals for the Jomon, which makes sense since they, since they helped with hunting. In Shiba, in Shiba and Kanagawa, there was a particular type of burial, in which the disease was placed on the floor of the house where dead had occurred and covered with several layers of shells. The site was then abandoned. This may have been a purification ritual, as a result of the house being considered impure or a place of bad luck. Let's turn our attention now to the skeletons that have been exhumed from their tombs by archaeologists now that thousands of years have passed, and in particular to their skulls. What do 80 to 90% of these skulls have in common? The absence of several teeth. And I'm not talking about those that fall out with age, but teeth that were purposely removed. This practice, which also extended to the Yayoi period, is called ritualistic tooth ablation. The teeth were removed using traumatic methods, by exerting force in a single blow, rather than extractive methods, by means of traction forces, for example the pulling movement exerted by a rope. Not only do traumatic methods cause more pain, they also increase the risk of broken roots being left behind, which was found to occur in 10.2% of the cases. It's a little difficult for me to understand such a practice. I can't help thinking about the risk of infection and the long-term consequences of losing several healthy teeth, when you add to that the very real risk of losing several more accidentally. Tattoos are also permanent and can mark social status, so why lose teeth, right? On the other hand, my cat, for example, has gum disease since he was a little kitten and lost almost all his teeth when he was very young. He uses the teeth he has left well, thought, and they are very sharp. When he bites your ankles, you can really feel it. And he doesn't even seem to have much trouble eating hard food. Maybe having all your teeth isn't so vital. But it does bother me a bit, I guess. Although the specifics are unclear, what is known is that the extraction of it was ritualistic. Different achievements throughout life would thus be commemorated through the extraction of different classes of teeth. In addition, different skulls show different patterns of ablation. There are differences depending on whether the individual is male or female, young or old, etc 
which shows that these rituals were more than traditions. They also serve to mark social position. Radical physical transformations, which are impossible to hide or alter, show who an individual is in a community context. Arunari, in 1979, identified several patterns of ablation. Absence of the two upper canines, absence of the two upper canines and four incisors, absence of all canines, both upper and lower, absence of four incisors, and absence of two incisors. There is some controversy about what each pattern means. The removal of the upper canines is almost certainly a coming of age ritual. This is the right that generates the less controversy. It is well documented that when a Jomon became an adult, at the time of puberty, he had these two canines removed. It is possible that marriage, or the arrival of marriageable age, the death of a spouse, and or death of parents, were events accompanied by ablation rituals. Individuals without canines and foreign scissors were usually buried with valuable funerary goods, so this pattern might indicate prestige. The removal of two incisors might mean that the person was married more than once. It should be noted that these patterns have not all been found in contemporary skulls. Although we are talking about the Jomon period, this was a practice that, as already mentioned, extended into the Yayoi period, and different areas correspond to different patterns of ablation and the removal of different classes of teeth. In addition to the absence of specific teeth, there are some other physical characteristics that the Jomon are known to have possessed, which can be deduced through genetic analysis and lifestyle. Scholars know, therefore, that the average height of people at the time was approximately 1 meter and 57 centimeters for males and 1 meter and 47 centimeters for females. They had a muscular build and sculpted faces with double eyelids and thick lips. The archaeologists found many eggs of the decorid parasite, which indicates that the Jomon suffered from frequent abdominal pain. The ankle joints were found to be deformed because the Jomon sat on their ankles and spent a lot of time squatting. The Jomon carried genetic alleles associated with the high tolerance for alcohol at earwax, medium to light skin tone, fine dark hair and brown eyes. Some of the samples evaluated showed a predisposition to certain ill problems, the development of liver spots from too much sun exposure and high levels of both triglycerides and blood sugar. There is also evidence that they frequently consumed fatty animals, both terrestrial and marine. Everything we have seen, from the ceramics and instruments used in rituals, the mysterious dogu, the funerary objects, the ways in which the dead were buried, among other aspects, gives us clues to, as to what the Jomon people's beliefs were. It is thought that Jomon beliefs were similar to those held by Shintoism in its early days. They thus add roots in animism, the belief that all natural objects, animals and phenomena possess spirits or souls, and possibly shamanism, the belief that some individuals, shamans, can act as intermediaries between humans and spirits. The Jomon would venerate the natural elements, animals and spirits, and revere their ancestors. Other religions that may be similar include the Ryukyuan and those practiced by the Hainu. It is thought that the Jomon faith might be the origin of Shintoism, which is one of Japan's two main religions. In simple terms, according to Shinto, the natural world is inhabited by kami, which are deities, and these deities can be found everywhere, in particularly ancient and grand trees, mountains, rivers, etc. Originally, Shinto teachings were passed down orally, through rituals aimed at maintaining the balance between man, the kami, and nature. And in these rituals, there were purifications, offerings, recitations, and community feasts. There were no texts or sacred books. Shrines such as those found today in Japan also only came into existence in the 6th and 7th centuries. With the rise of agriculture, rituals began to coincide with important occasions related to it, such as planting or harvest time. So the Jomon performed rituals, but knowing for sure what happened in, the, in these rituals is impossible, we can only speculate. In some archaeological sites, dolphin bones have been found arranged in specific ways and accompanied by ceremonial objects. 
We can therefore speculate that rituals were practiced to commemorate successful hunts or to honor great hunters. In an archaeological site located in Akita Prefecture, ceramic mushrooms have been found, so it is thought that these mushrooms, which cause psychedelic effects, might have been used by Jomon spiritual leaders in a religious context. Around 30 species of magic mushrooms grow in the Japanese archipelago. Studies carried out on skeletons found in the Tsukumo Shell Mound in Okayama Prefecture and the Yoshigo Shell Mound in Aishi Prefecture so that there, are, there were women who wore a large number of shell bracelets on both arms. These bracelets were too small for adults, so it is thought that these women had been wearing them since they were children and very fragile, so they couldn't take care of normal day-to-day -day tasks, such as collecting shellfish or plants. Therefore, it is possible that these women were chosen from a very young age to perform a special function, probably related to the spiritual. Some scholars believe that they were the shamans, who presided over the rituals of the Jomon communities of the late and final phases. For a long time, the idea that in a Jomon community everyone was equal, with the exception of one individual, who would be the chief of the tribe or the head of the village, was generally accepted. But recent discoveries called this idea into question. Some settlements, as we have seen, were very large, had storage pits and elevated structures, and some archaeologists believe that there must have been someone who controlled the flow of food, from collection to distribution. Furthermore, as we saw in the previous video, many settlements specialize in the production of certain items or in obtaining certain resources, and they exported these raw materials and finished products to other locations. A trade network must imply that there was someone who controlled this trade. The very construction of Jomon settlements of the Kanju Shuraku type, where houses are arranged in a circular pattern with a central space, according to experts, requires effort, cooperation, communication and long-term planning, a system that requires people in charge. Finally, and as already mentioned, there is the question of funerary objects. At the beginning of the Jomon era, these goods appeared less frequently and were simple things, such as stone tools or simple pots. But as time went by, these goods became diversified. Some people were buried with more precious possessions than others, and with larger quantities of possessions. And there were those who were dressed in red lacquered clothes before being buried. If it is dubious that in the Paleolithic period men and women had different roles, this is clear in the Jomon period, because fractures have been found in male skeletons more often than in female skeletons, five times more. Men were therefore more involved in hunting and construction. And that concludes the video. Let's see how my pot turned out. Here it is. I think it could have turned out worse. I had some struggles that made it harder than I thought it would be. I will talk more about them in the comments. But I think it could have been made by a six-year-old Jomon child, I suppose. But yeah, what, what do you think? In the next video, I will talk about each of the phases of the Jomon period, putting them in a sort of chronology, so to speak. Because although I've been talking about the era all this time, I didn't follow a temporal order. I talked about the beginning of the period as much, as much as the end. And I think doing this will help you sort out your ideas. Not that the next video is going to be a repeat of everything I've already said, but in order. It's not going to be that. I'm going to bring you new information as well. So I hope to see you there. Until then, stay well.